Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, let me start the meeting uh, between the NRRC and the NRA. Uh, this was uh, proposed by NRRC uh, to introduce their ongoing activities. And uh, also, we will exchange our views and opinions regarding risk uh, informed decision making. So, uh, let me introduce the attendees of today. Uh, I'm Toyoshi Fuketa, Chairman of the NRA, and uh, Commissioner Shinsuke Yamanaka, Yamanaka is sitting just next to me, and uh, Professor George Apostrakis. I don't think a detailed in introduction is needed, but uh, he was a prominent professor of the MIT uh, in the field of uh, risk analysis. And then also at the same time, he had been in uh, NRC's ACRS for 15 years. Then uh, after MIT, he's, he became a, one of a commissioner in US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And then uh, after TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi accident, Japanese industries created a new organization in CREAPI, uh, one of the sector of the CREAPI, uh, which is uh, NRRC. Nuclear Risk Research Center, and he became a first head of that organization. And uh, uh, Dr. Richard Miserb is just next to uh, Professor Apostrakis. Uh, well, uh, he he was a former chairperson, chairman of the U.S. NRC. Uh, in my memory, it's it's around. 2003 to 2007 or? 1999 to ah, so, 2003. Three. I'm sorry. Uh, so he, uh, he took a leading role to introductions uh, of the new inspection system ROP to USNRC. And also after uh, uh, he retired from the NRC, he had been in, uh, president of the Carnegie Institute more than 10 years, and uh, now the President Emeritus of the uh, Carnegie Institute. Uh, he, for me, he is kind of special person because he's, uh, he's, uh, he holds judicial doctor and uh, PhD in applied physics at the same time. So quite uh, extraordinary career he has. And currently, he is uh, an ex executive advisor to NRRC. And at, at the same time, he's uh, one of the member and uh, has a reading role in uh, international advisor to the NR NRA. Okay. Are you satisfied about that? Can you say something? So can I, uh, can we go enter to the, your presentation? Sure. Okay, please. Chairman Fuketa and Commissioner Yamanaka, thank you very much for agreeing to have us here today for exchange of views. Uh, I will go over my slides highlighting the points I want to make. I'm not going to go every because the idea is for us to exchange views, as the chairman said. So I will first talk about our views regarding risk-informed decision-making, then PRA quality, and finally, safety goals. Now, our main thesis is that in order to make rational decisions, we have to use both the traditional deterministic uh, approach as well as uh, uh, information from risk analysis. Neither one by itself is sufficient, in my view, for uh, rational decision making. I have two examples there from uh, PRAs that identified some of the uh, important points that were missed by the traditional regulations in the United States. The second sub-bullet, in fact, is very important because these were industry-sponsored PRAs, and they were the first one to say that fires and earthquakes can be among the dominant contributors to risk. I'd like to emphasize that a PRA has to be plant specific because only in the PRA model we can include unique 
features of the plant. The regulations are by their very nature generic. As an example, I say that uh, you know, we plotted the core damage frequencies of United States plants, and there was quite a variability in those. And at the same time, these plants were licensed under the same system. So the message there is that there is a plant-specific nature uh, in the plant model. Now, one last point. It is very popular to talk about the weaknesses of PRA, the uncertainties in PRA, and so on. But you rarely see, at the same time, a discussion of the weaknesses of the traditional system, how it handles uncertainty, and so on. And that's something that has bothered me for a long time. Now, there are major challenges in Japan. And I think the first bullet almost says it all. Everybody in the nuclear business, including regulatory staff and industry staff, have been focusing on complying with the regulations for a very long time. And that create. I have to slow down every now and then for the translators. Uh, and that creates a particular culture, which is a compliance culture. And now we are saying we want to move to a risk and form culture. And I believe there will be a lot of obstacles along the way. People will have to learn how to do this. They have to be trained and so on. But there are two important steps that uh, have already been taken. One is the decision by the NRA to implement the reactor oversight process, which in my mind will be a great training exercise. And the other one is the strategic and action plans that we issued uh, earlier this year and this is a picture from the strategic plan that is endorsed by all the utilities in Japan. And basically what it says is that if you have a problem in step one, you find some deficiency or something, then you go to step two where you evaluate the risk significance of that issue by looking at uh, deterministic assessments, probabilistic risk assessments, uh, experimental results, and so on. And then from step two, there will be a set of options for action to step three, where the decision will actually be, will be made. And uh, again, the decision-making process will include the information from the risk assessment, but also other things uh, engineering uh, considerations, uh, compensatory measures that perhaps the utilities are taking, and so on. And then you go back to step one, where you will monitor the effectiveness of the solution that was adopted. Now, there is a lot of history behind this, but I just wanted to give you the flavor of what we're talking about. Now, a major issue is the quality of the PRAs that will be used in this decision-making process. So the first point is that we really need a plant-specific PRA uh, for risk-informed decision-making, but also for the, for the ROP. Uh, the PRA process is really embedded in the ROP. You can't separate it out. Now, because PRA is a big undertaking, it's a very ambitious uh, process because it claims to model the whole plant, hardware and human behavior. So it's extremely ambitious. So there will naturally be uncertainties. And for some in, 
uh, accident initiators such as earthquakes, tornadoes, and volcanoes, uh, these uncertainties can be fairly large. So it appears then that it is very legitimate to ask how can I make decisions, risk-informed decisions, in the presence of these uncertainties. One way to assure the quality of the PRA is to have a review by independent experts. And that was actually done for the first industry-sponsored PRAs for Zion and Indian Point by Sandia National Laboratories on behalf of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It was very expensive, very resource uh, intensive, and um, obviously the NRC could not live with that. They could not do this for every single PRA that uh, was used. So we needed a practical solution. And uh, first, they decided to develop the so-called SPAR models at Idaho National Engineering Laboratory. Uh, but my understanding is that SPAR models are not used as extensively anymore. They use the utilities PRAs. Uh, another important point, I said that for external events, external hazards, the uncertainties can be very large. At the same time, not all risk-informed decisions require consideration of external events. You can do a lot of things just with the internal events for, about which we feel more comfort, comfortable. So this is a series of actions that occurred in the United States to assure that the quality of the PRAs is reasonable. Scientific societies issued standards, and now there is a joint committee on nuclear risk management of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and the American Nuclear Society, uh, and they issue standards. Then the NRC staff looks at each standard and decides whether to accept it or not. Or usually what happens is they accept a large part of the standard, but they may raise objections about some specific aspects of the standard. The peer reviews follow the standards, and the Nuclear Energy Institute issued the guidance on how these peer reviews should be conducted. And uh, the NRC some of the NRC staff and the ACRS went to such peer reviews and they came back and said, yeah, this is a serious uh, process. So the NRC approved the NEI peer review process. So now if you comply with all these uh, documents, the NRC's burden reviewing the PRAs has been relaxed. However, the NRC staff has the right to go to the utilities headquarters and review any part of the PRA they like. So the regulatory agency always reserves the right to say, yeah, you've done all this, but we still have some concerns, so we would like to learn more about it. Now, again, regarding the uncertainties, I'm giving you an example for a, a landmark regu regulatory guide, 1.174, which has a diagram like this. You have the core damage frequency of the plant here, and if you propose a change to the licensing basis using risk information, the vertical axis Show you, shows you the change in core damage frequency. This is delta CDF. And there, as you see, there are three regions. One, no changes allowed. Two, and three. The interesting thing about this is that you're supposed to make these considerations by using the mean value from the PRA. 
But what happens if the mean value is very close to the boundary? Then there is a very nice paragraph that says that the subject, the analysis will be subjected to increased technical review and management attention as you approach the boundaries. So don't think that if your mean value is way down here, a little bit below the boundary, you are home free. And that these values of 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 6 should be interpreted as indicative values only. So, and the shading of the picture shows that, that as you approach this boundary, it becomes darker here. That means more management attention, more exhaustive review. If you are way down here, then probably there will not be such a detailed review. So, this is a, a very important message because it relates also to the safety goals that we will talk about later, that these are not so-called bright lines. They are indications. And just being below the line in the acceptable region, that doesn't mean that your application is acceptable. Because the mean value may be here, but the <coughs> uncertainty tail of the distribution can be well into the unacceptable region. That's why it has to be reviewed very carefully. Yes? Well, uh, does the US NLC has, have any practice to apply this concept in decision making, for example, or licensing procedure or any? Well, this guide has been public since 1997, mm -hmm. so we're talking about 21 years. Mm -hmm. I cannot give you a specific example, but I'm sure the issue has been raised over these 20 yeah. years. Yeah. So, there mu and another thing that happens mm -hmm. is the industry itself, mm -hmm. when they see that they're approaching the line, they do something about it. Mm -hmm. Very rarely they will do something and say, here, NRC, look at it. Mm. They know what's going to happen as you approach the line. So either they would take additional measures or they will do something mm -hmm. because they don't want to find themselves. In it. And it's very similar. You know, when I was younger, I worked on the Zion Indian Point PRX. And some of the contributions from FIRE, for example, were unacceptable. The NRC never saw that because the utility said, well, gee, we can't go there with that. And they took measures to bring the point, the mean value below the acceptable goal. So the, this is a very important point that the utility itself usually takes action before they go to the NRC. Mm -hmm. Okay? They will never go there with a value that's close to 10 to the minus 5, in my opinion. Well, I, I understand that this is the results uh, from the uh, well-defined, well-prepared discussions. And I, I like that, the figure, this figure, and also the, the paragraphs. Uh, uh, paragraphs sound nice to me as well. That, uh, uh, when I uh, look at the activities or history of the U.S. NRC, it's, it's not easy to find any specific practice. Uh, yes. the, uh, the, the, these concepts That's right. uh, applied. I agree. Yeah. And I'm telling you why. Mm. Most yeah. of the time, the industry takes care of this before they go. Oh, okay. Uh, but also this points out to the fact, the fact that uh, any decision of some significance is always the result of some deliberation, mm -hmm. either among NRC managers or between the industry and management and so on, and the NRC. It's never one number. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I come up with a number here, that doesn't mean mean that automatically it will be approved. Mm -hmm. It will be debated and how do they do it? Mm -hmm. As I said, the staff mm -hmm. has the right to go to the utility 
and look at the PRA. I don't think they do it very often, by the way, but they have the right, and the industry knows that they can do it, so they get ready for it. Can I go on? Okay. So now I want to give an overview of uh, what the industry has been doing in this country to improve the PRA quality. Uh, the NRC has been issuing and will issue guides on, already we issued one on human reliability analysis. We are completing now a, a fire PRA guide and uh, also a guide on data collection, which was not done rigorously in the past in Japan. We are developing models for seismic risk, volcanic risk, uh, tornadoes, and I think this is an important point. The shock process is uh, a very expensive process, and its objective is to come up with uh, quantitative hazard assessments of uh, seismic events. And uh, the reason why it's expensive is because its objective is to develop distributions that reflect the views of the community, not of a specific group. So here, Shikoku Electric Power Company agreed to do it. And by the way, I have found Shikoku to be a very progressive utility. It's one of the smaller utilities in Japan, and they agreed to do this. Mm -hmm. You would expect somebody with more resources to agree to do it. It's a three-year process. It involves everybody in Japan who has ever done anything on seismic risk. And there are workshops. I went to one of them. There were, I don't know, 70, 80 people uh, expressing their views regarding, uh, you know, what do you do when you have faults nearby or you, the area and so on. And we expect to have a final report published uh, in the first half of next year. We also started another research project on multi-unit PRA, which has become something that uh, Fukushima has pointed out that you shouldn't worry only about the un one unit but the others. And we are actively following uh, the IAEA uh, work on this. There was another workshop uh, earlier in August and two of our people went there. We have the methodology and we are using uh, Kashiwazaki Kariwa 6 and 7 uh, as the model plants. Uh, the technical advisory committee we have consists of uh, three, four, four foreigners, Americans, uh, well, one French, three Americans, and two Japanese professors, and they meet twice a year, and they write very frank letters regarding the quality of the research they see or the quality of the industry's work. And on Ikata 3 PRA, I show you two examples where they really insisted that the list of initiating events be expanded. And again, Ikat, uh, Shikoku complied. They never come back and say, no, we're not going to do this. But then we realize that the two times that uh, oh, uh, TAC meets is not sufficient, so now for Ikata 3, we have a group of uh, experts, and for KK7, we have uh, another group of experts going over details of the PRA and making proposals and so on. And NRA staff has already come to some of these meetings. And pa as part of uh, training people in risk-informed decision-making, we have three courses here. The first one is an introductory course. It will be about three days. We inherited it from Jansi. 
and it's for beginners, mm -hmm. and we are preparing for implementation in the fiscal in the current fiscal year. The next one was primarily being given by EPRI, and slowly we will switch to Japanese lecturers. And we inherited this also. Jansig was first sponsoring it. It's a six-week course, uh, and it's done in uh, one-week installments. And I believe at the next offering, NRA staff will also come. And the final one is really one of the most critical ones. How do you use risk information to make decisions? And this is for decision makers, obviously, nuclear power plant uh, managers. It's intended to be two days. Uh, it will be offered probably in January or maybe a little later. And. Um, we already have secured the participation of two senior people from America, Mr. William Dean, who used to be the director of NRR, the Nuclear Reactor Regulation Office, and Mr. Ed Halpin, who used to be uh, the CNO of a very progressive utility, South Texas project, then he moved to Pacific Gas and Electric, and now he's retired. So they will use primarily case studies and as I understand it, at this point, NRA is not invited. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, the second one, when I talked with the, my friend at uh, EPRI, you know, EPRI had a course of uh, provide the, uh, their skill to the NRRC and had a lecture course. And, and actually, she said uh, that we should be, I mean, the NRA should be invited to the course. And now it's, it's on the track, I think. For the second For the se yes. The second yes. I suspect mm -hmm. that after we offer the third course a couple of times, we'll invite mm -hmm. NRA. The beginning is always discomfort, you know, how do we do it? Mm -hmm. So we'll see, we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, now, the last subject is safety goals. The issue of safety goals is very important because it contributes to the answer to the question, how safe is safe enough? To tell people that the plant meets the regulations, therefore is safe, doesn't mean anything. On the other hand, if people are not used to thinking in terms of risk, that creates a challenge as well. Uh, I know that some in the industry have been talking about continuous safety improvement. My personal view is you cannot continuously improve safety. You have to stop at some point. So I would propose to use continuous risk management. You manage risk. We shouldn't make unrealistic promises. Uh, now, in Japan, there are informal goals that have been floating around from some years back on the core damage frequency, the containment failure frequency, uh, and more recently, the frequency of release of more than 100 terabecquerel of cesium after Fukushima. My concern is that these informal goals may actually become may be used routinely without the scrutiny they deserve. What I hear from people is, oh, you know, we have goals in Japan. Well, you don't have goals in Japan. You have something that was proposed years ago. I think Professor Kondo was uh, involved and so on. But that's not how you establish goals. So on the next slide, I'm propo well, first of all, I should have rephrased my first bullet. It is the NRA that ultimately will say what the goals are. But that should be the result of a deliberation among the regulators, the industry, scientific societies, and the public. This is not an easy thing to do. It took six years in America to do it. However, it's very important. 
but it's really the NRA that ultimately will decide. Now, I'm giving you a couple of examples here of goals, or three examples. In the United States, we simply use point values. The core damage frequency should be less than this. In England, they actually give two values. One is the basic safety level, which really you are not supposed to exceed. And then there is the, what they call it, the basic safety objective below which you take no action. So this is related to my earlier point that we shouldn't talk about continuous safety improvement. Because when you reach that low level of 10 to the minus 6, you are really wasting resources. Okay? And I'm very pleased to see that the British have realized that. <laughs> but the point is, that's why we need the deliberative process to talk about these things. What is appropriate for Japan and so on? And then you have a proposal from the IAEA, which I like very much. It's a hierarchical process. It starts with the top level, and the top level is some generic statement like, we should protect public health and safety in the environment. That's fine. And then as you go down, you list more and more measures. And what I like about this, that it is not focused only on numbers. So at the level, or the upper level, you will see a big matrix that says, oh, we have uh, defense in depth, we have emergency plans, uh, and then we also have a, a goal for core damage frequency. And I think that is a much better way to, of communication that instead of saying to the public, yeah, 10 to the minus 4, that doesn't mean much. But if you also list the deterministic things we are doing, I think you are giving, communicating a much better picture of what it's all about. I don't want to go, you see, we have some requirements that are technology neutral. You have the requirements that are up society, site, facility. But it's a very interesting concept. So my final remarks. Risk-informed decision making is the rational way to proceed, both for the industry and the regulatory agency. The PRAs that are used should be planned specific. We need to change our culture. And by the way, this is the most difficult part. Changing a culture can never be done in a week or in a month or in a year. It's a painful process. And I'm talking about the culture both of the industry and the regulators. Uh, I really like the two developments, the ROP, the decision to use the ROP from the NRA and the industry's strategic and action plans. Uh, the issue of PRA quality has to be addressed by standards, regulatory guidance, and peer reviews. We should never forget that risk-informed decision-making is an inherently subjective process, so it takes time for people to be trained and understand the limitations of PRA, the limitations of the traditional system, and how to make decisions. And the deliberative process, in my opinion, for establishing safety goals should start fairly soon. And with this set of happy remarks, mm -hmm. thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, George. Thank you. Well, could you show me the, your, the first and the third page? The third first slide? page? Three. Three. This one? Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we means the, uh, all four agree that the, the first led, I mean, the, uh, the combination of the risk informed approach and uh, uh, deterministic approach. Uh, we need to have a, the, uh, a better combination in mm -hmm. order to uh, realize the, the better risk uh, decision, uh, better decision making process and also the uh, adequate. Uh, protection uh, defined by regulatory body. 
and we you emphasize the risk uh, is uh, pond specific. Yes. I fully ag uh, agree that, and uh, but at the same time, uh, because risk is pond specific, so the analysis uh, had better or should be made by made in house. Yes, I agree. You know, the uh, for example, Ikata Unit Three, the uh, the analysis should be done by uh, Shikoku. Yes, but I I at the same time I understand the situation is not uh, uh, not uh, mature or fully prepared enough. But our goal or our purpose uh, to require the plant specific variation. Uh, I would like to emphasize the uh, these risk analysis uh, effort should be done in house. Every time we meet with industry representatives, we tell them the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, up until recently or even today, for Ikata, for example, it was MHI that did and maintained yeah. the model. But there is a gradual transfer to the plant people. It was really, uh, well, you know, in the United States too, in the early days, the Zion Indian Point, for example, it was done by a consulting firm, or actually three consulting firms. And slowly, the utilities began to catch up and do their PR. If, if there is a unique issue like seismic, mm -hmm. I mean, they always go to consultants, but it's the utility that does it. And we are trying to promote that point of view in Japan. And I haven't heard any objections yet, mm -hmm. but it's a slow process, you know, you don't transfer everything. <laughs> in a, yeah. Now, some of the, uh, no, no, no. The, the vendors sometimes have a subsidiary that does it for them, but still, that's not the same as the utility doing it. As far as I know, a uh, certain number of the experts are in the Tepsis, which is uh, the company yeah. uh, that belongs to, but uh, it's, it's just one of the group of the TEPCO. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also uh, Mitsubishi, MHI, has a certain number of the experts there. But uh, in each utility, you know, for example, Shikoku or the uh, lot of small utilities, uh, I think they still uh, face a challenge to yes. have uh, enough capability, yes. capability to do the, their own analysis. Yes, yes, it's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. In fact, I now I remember two and a half, three years ago when uh, the ICATA 3 PRA mm -hmm. was presented to our technical advisory mm -hmm. committee, the presentation was done by MHI. Okay. And the committee at the end said, we don't want this to happen again. Next time it's Shikoku mm -hmm. that should make the presentation. And indeed, Shikoku was making the presentation. So. Again, as I said, it, it will take some time, but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it's the plant people who know the plant. They should do it. But at the same time, the NLA uh, needs to have our own capability to review the result of the PRA or review the, the model. Uh, well, I'm going to talk a uh, little talk about the, in my present, uh, yeah. talk about this in my presentation, but uh, we need to have, a, we need to have a, uh, our own capability, yes. but uh, we have a, uh, only limited number of the experts inside NRA, so now we try to have a support from the, uh, the outside, uh, for example, Jensen Hughes, or, which is a US consultant, uh, company, mm -hmm. and also we uh, uh, try to have a better, co uh, better, not collaboration, but the good interaction with the industry's people. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, both 
in this country, both industries and the regulator face the, uh, the similar problem to have uh, to catch up the enough capability to do the uh, the better better, P, uh, better P, PRA. So may I have some you questions? Sure? Yeah. Um, in page seven of your slide. Okay. Let me do it real quick. Page. Oh God, I can't see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll find. It. Yeah, go ahead with your question. Yeah. So for assuring PLA quality, so you uh, communicate to uh, uh, nuclear industry. Uh, so NRC approved uh, uh, NEI peer reviews. So uh, do you think there exists uh, sound uh, relationship of trust uh, between NRC and uh, nuclear industry in the United States? Now, yes. In the old days, no. Let me give you an example. When the industry, that was 19, maybe 81, 82, when the industry came up with this, the second bullet, the NRC staff was shocked. How can the industry come and tell us that there are important contributors mm -hmm. and we didn't know? Mm -hmm. So it's things like that that happen not very often, but when they happen, they build confidence. Mm -hmm. Okay? Another one was when. Uh, the first risk-informed application was extending the allowed out outage time. I believe they extended it to two weeks from three days. And I was talking to the staff and say, well, wait, they will do it the 14th day, the last day. They did it within five days. That also built confidence. So you have to have real evidence that the industry is serious about it and, of course, the, the regulator is serious, but this was really a major point. Mm -hmm. To go to the regulatory staff and say, you have ignored earthquakes and fires and we find that they're important. So <laughs> I was there. Mm -hmm. I was there. So it, it, it takes time to build it, but it's very important to build that uh, confidence. I'm taking too much time, I, I don't know. <laughs> Richard, would you like to say something? Well, I, I, I had commented to George on his slides before he delivered them, <laughs> so I'm very comfortable uh, with them. Uh, I think that uh, we'd love to hear your presentation. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Mm. Oh, you're eliminating me completely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. Here we go. Okay, so I prepare a very short presentation. I try to make it short, but I don't know right now. Uh, this is my first slide as an introduction. The NLA considers that the risk-informed approach is important and inevitable to realize an effective and efficient regulation, along with the NLA's existing deterministic approach. We already discussed about this. And uh, uh, the risk-informed approach uh, provides uh, more than several benefits, but uh, such as uh, risk insights provide a uh, capability to concentrate our resources on important events, uh, components, and activities. And the prioritization of issues with safety impact uh, leads to an effective regulation and improvement, safety improvements. And the variation of risk significances improves uh, regulators' ability to make right decisions and responses to events. 
because of this, uh, the NLA is contemplating PRA utilization in decision making for various issues. But we also face uh, more than several challenges. What I would like to emphasize is uh, wrong successive efforts such as uh, data ac accumulation and the development of plant specific models lie in front, lie in front of us, not only at the NLA but also industries. And uh, in particular, data accumulation has a, a particular importance for Japanese utilities. Uh, in terms of the uh, data collection, data accumulation, uh, unfortunately, our industries are far behind. So that's uh, uh, one of the big challenge now we are facing. And of course, natural hazards such as earthquake, tsunami, and uh, volcanic activity have a particular importance in Japan. But understanding and knowledge, epistem, on those are limited and keep being limited as a nature. And the NLA pursues a level of awareness on PRA in each layer of our decision making process. Mm -hmm. Inspectors or, or, or each uh, and a mid level manager or high level managers. So this is ongoing efforts at NLA. New revised oversight program is designed to deploy a risk-informed and performance-based approach as a major implementation philosophy. The NLA plans to use plant-specific models to be developed by licenses. This is the, the dif different from the, the way in the United States, I think. No, now they use the licenses. Now the NLC uses? Because it's more detailed. Well. The PRA of the licensee is much more detailed on the spot. Time to time, I, 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 I hear something about the, the, the uh, discussions or, or controversy be between NRC and uh, industries uh, regarding the utilization of the plant specific model. Oh, there will always be disagreements, <laughs> especially if you are near a red mm. <laughs> in the ROP. I mean, uh, they yes. may disagree, mm. but basically they look at the utilities PRA. That doesn't mean they accept it. Anyway, uh, we are going to use uh, yeah. going to use uh, the models yeah. uh, to be developed by licenses. Uh, but of course, after reviewing uh, their suitability and applicability, yeah. so the NLA defined the review items by referring to uh, ASME, American Society for Mechanical Engineers, and American Nuclear Society, RA-S-2008, and also uh, in Japan, Atomic Energy Society of Japan uh, create uh, uh, standards uh, such as SC-P08. So the NLA, uh, of course, modified licenses models if necessary. Sure. And the NLA is sitting on, in on the industry's peer review meeting. Uh, as far as I heard from uh, our staff members, uh, the industry's peer review meeting was quite serious and uh, very effective. And he and she said, uh, uh, well, uh, they are impressed by the seriousness of, of the, this review, review meeting. And the NLA is developing handy tools for inspectors to use risk information in their planning and determination. Then we have uh, several concerns, and this is one of the concerns, uh, decision maker awareness. Decision makers should be aware of modeling assumptions, uncertainties, and sensitivities. 
uh, but how far should they be aware of the nature of PLA? For example, uh, PLA outcomes are not point estimates. Mm -hmm. so, so when uh, decision makers learn about the uh, uh, pro uh, provided uh, risk information, uh, in many cases, they only hear about the, the point number. Yeah. But look at these uh, profiles. The median is higher in blue, but the upper bound of 95% a 95% confidence interval interval is higher in orange. Yes. So uh, in many cases, including me decision makers are not PRA expert and they don't need to be a no. expert but in some degree they need to know the uh, the nature of the of the PRA because otherwise they need to have a discussion they need to have argued that and they need uh, they need to it is a capability to need to have a debate among the decision makers. That's what I meant by increased management attention. The management attention is from the regulator. So they have to understand these things, that perhaps the orange curve is more dangerous yeah. <laughs> than the blue, <laughs> even though the median is to the left, it, because you have this tail. Yeah. So it takes some maturity mm -hmm. to really appreciate mm -hmm. that. Because mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of, I can say this is uh, one of the lessons learned from the TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi accident. It is, uh, you know, the, uh, the, our, one of the, our primary challenges is uh, how, to, how to design uh, adequate protection against uh, raw, uh, the low frequency and high consequence yes. Yes. Uh, event. Yes. So those kind of the, uh, the event has a lot of this orange distribu distribution. No, I, we fully agree with this. Yeah. And another concern is a balance between principles. By the way, I like the regulatory guide 1.1974, 1 and it has already a uh, number of the years of history. And the USNRC's regulatory guide 1.174 1 describes five principles. And uh, the question is, how, to, how do we balance individual principles? Should an individual principle override all other principles? So there was a, this is a kind of never-ending story. Yes. Uh, we always need to, to consider about the, those bonds. And uh, this regulatory guide uh, describes about the defense in depth. And uh, we like this paragraph uh, very much. So I just uh, read it. Uh, defense in depth has been uh, has been and continues to be an effective way to account for uncertainties in equipment and human performance, and in particular, to account for the potential for unknown and unforeseen failure mechanisms or phenomena, which, because they are unknown or unforeseen, uh, which are not reflected in either the PRA or traditional engineering analysis. Yes. Fully agree. Good lines. But, mm. but, the risk is, you see, if you go to the principles, because mm. I know, mm. I was there, yeah. it says, preserve the defense in depth philosophy. Mm. There is a reason why philosophy yeah, is okay. there, because if you just say preserve defense in depth, then you don't agree to anything else. No. 
You're right. So if somebody comes and says, oh, we did the risk analysis and we really don't need the containment, mm. well, you're dead. Mm. I mean, there is no way mm. that mm. this could. But the changes that are made using risk information are really small. The inspection interval, uh, maybe something else. Mm. But you never really compromise defense in depth. Mm. I mean, maybe in a hundred years, but not now. <laughs> And then safety goal. Uh, discussing a risk in a quantitative manner could eliminate safety myths uh, such as a zero risk il illusion. And uh, another safety myth is uh, all the reactors are equally safe. On the other hand, uh, there exists a risk to create another version of illusions. So we need to be vigilant. And the rigorous, and, at the same, and also here, uh, awareness issues. Uh, yeah. Rigorous and prudent considerations of assumptions, uncertainties, and sensitivities are critical. Uh, we should know there exist unknown failure mechanisms, uh, large uncertainties in natural hazards, and also, uh, this is also the challenge because uh, it's, uh, technically speaking, it's uh, extremely difficult or impossible to uh, assess the, the uh, frequency or probability of man-made events, terrorism. So this is my last slide, uh, safety culture. Lessons learned from TEPCOR's Fukushima Daiichi accident uh, on use of PRA. We should avoid any use of PRA in a manner to contribute to another version of, of safety myth. And we should place the highest priority for minimizing uh, incompleteness, that is, an uncertainty about where the true risk lies. So not risk-based, but risk-informed decision-making should be implemented only under a sound safety culture. Mm -hmm. So the NLA must create an environment where a gene readiness think priority to safety can survive. Okay, so thank you for your attention. And uh, I prepare this presentation uh, with the discussions with these two. Uh, Dr. Masashi Hirano is an expert of the PRA uh, at the NRA. And uh, Shunichi Kaneko is now responsible for our reform of the uh, inspection system. Thank you. And uh, I'm happy to answer your question. I fully agree with everything you said. I will make only one point. Mm. Your concern about the safety goals mm. has to do with the frequencies. Mm. And that's why I said the IAEA approach is much broader. Mm -hmm. It will show you the frequencies, but also defense in depth, emergency mm. plans, and other. And that gives a much fuller mm picture of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And that supports my argument that we really need a deliberative process to bring those ideas mm -hmm. up and mm -hmm. you express your concerns, we look at the various approaches and see how we, we can accommodate it. But I, I, I am very pleased to hear everything you said because that means we don't have to try very hard to convince <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> So, Richard? five o'clock. Uh, uh, let me just make an observation uh, mm -hmm. here, and that is that in many respects, I think this is a rather remarkable uh, opportunity mm -hmm. we've had to interact mm -hmm. because it has demonstrated, to me at least, that we're both the NRC and the NRA are headed in exactly the same direction. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and that, and it's one of proceeding with risk-informed decision making, which uh, is actually a remarkable change for Japan from the basically regulatory compliance approach that it had followed before. And it's not going to be easy because it means that there's a some radical change that needs to be made. But uh, we're in. NRRC was actually established and assist in that effort, trying to do it. Um, and we fully agree that there are going to be challenges of exactly the type that both of you have described in this implementation. It's not going to be easy, and no one thinks it is going to be easy. I think the important uh, point to be made there is that uh, by having a kind of dialogue that we've had today, uh, we can advance the approach from both sides to make sure we get to the right answers for Japan. So uh, I think we uh, really appreciate the opportunity to interact with you today. Thank you. Very true. Um, so thank you both. Um, so uh, you gave us uh, a good suggestions. And uh, uh, due to various reasons, uh, there exists no sound relationship of trust between uh, uh, NRA and uh, licensees. So uh, to, to uh, improve uh, uh, safety of nuclear plant, uh, we have to uh, enhance uh, trusting relationship uh, between us. Yes. So uh, I think uh, uh, we NRA have to use the results of uh, a PLA as a communication tool mm -hmm. uh, with uh, licensees. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, from 2020, uh, NRA will introduce a risk-informed uh, inspection system, um, ROP. So uh, this autumn, we'll, we will uh, carry out uh, the uh, trial of new inspection systems. So, and so this appeared to be a good chance for communication with each other. Thank you very much. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, well, uh, I think in this discussion, I, uh, I hope this discussion is uh, productive for both sides. And also that uh, what is imp uh, what it is important is the important thing is to keep having uh, this kind of the opportunity not only with the uh, the chairman and the head or or each uh, but between each level of the of the uh, staff members uh, to have a better communication to have more frequent occasions are uh, uh, quite important I think mm -hmm. and. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Yamanaka said, uh, uh, we need we need to create uh, the uh, the situation having the mutual trust and also uh, high level of the technical capability in each each side or in industries and also in at the NLA. Well, I'm happy to have uh, this, this opportunity today, and uh, thank you very much for uh, your, uh, thank you very much for your coming and uh, presentations. Thank you for having us. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.